Let's talk about the challenge of practicing across state lines in the United States as a licensed counselor. And to discuss this, I'm really glad to have with me Kathleen Shannon. She is the owner of LPC License Info. Uh, her company helps clinicians with that enormous task of getting licensed in other states so that you can practice in other states because we are mobile people. So yes, Kathleen, thank you very much for joining me to discuss this. Ray, thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, so it's, it's a major challenge. I mean, licensure has created a big time challenge for us as clinicians. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just speak to that a bit, like uh, about that challenge of licensure in the United States, um, because that's why people come to you to, to kind of overcome that. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that, that challenge? Well, uh, I kind of knew it was a challenge when I moved to North Carolina, where I live now, from Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, I went and went through the process, and each state, of course, has its different requirements that I didn't realize were going to be so different. Mm -hmm. And everything from, is this going to be an online application? Is this going to be paper? Is it going to be whatever? Uh, do I need to take another exam? Do they like my exam? All these things were just ending up being pretty overwhelming. And for a while, I was licensed in both Washington State and North Carolina. But this was, of course, pre-pandemic. But once I realized we're looking at time zones, we're looking at other things and other limitations that telehealth has, that doing telehealth across the country has its own limitations with certain populations. So that's, it's a big thing. And of course, when that pandemic hit and everybody had to leave, namely my clients uh, and myself, I had to go down to another place to you know take care of family and whatnot. I had to realize, okay, my neighboring state is going to require me to take another whole exam. And I've been doing this for 22 years. Mm-hmm. I'm of the firm belief I need all the information. Don't tell me that what I've gathered is incorrect. I could probably use that. They have since decided to ax that part. I think a number of people spoke up to that effect. Um, but therefore, I couldn't see a client who had moved to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a really, that was a big problem. And I can't just abandon care of my client. And some mm -hmm. states, not all, some states did give provision to see people for 90 days once they moved to their other state, but not all states did. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was just a big mess. And then other people were coming to me and they were saying, well, what do I need here? What do I need there? What do I need the other thing? And it just, it, it needed to, somebody just needed to sit with these people and walk them through the process and have them realize that it is not that complicated that there are some global things that you can do that's going to set you up for licensure in every state that once you get those, you're good to go everywhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. So clinicians want to get licensed in multiple states because their clients move and because they move or they, they practice in a very specific niche and there's demand for their services throughout the world. Um, so it's, it's really helpful to, to not have those, uh, those boundary limitations but then the process of getting licensed in another state can be very complicated because some states have reciprocity, uh, but the, the, I guess, you know, what that reciprocity looks like is different. Um, they have different requirements, different uh, courses that are required, hours of supervision that are required, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so being able to figure that out um, and apply uh quickly get your license quickly is quite a challenge and then keeping up with all the licensure uh, with the renewal process what's required for renewal the changes the fee all that is is quite a challenge so you help people navigate that they so clinicians come to you uh, because they want to get licensed in another state and they don't want to spend hours trying to figure out how to do it so they come to you they pay you and you handhold them through the process of getting licensed in another state is that I right? Do. I do. Now, I only work with counselors. Social workers are going to have to do their own thing. And mm -hmm. evidently, marriage and family therapists are going to do their thing. Uh, 
with the psych a psychologist, they have psi-pact going on. And so therefore they can be part of a, a compact situation. Now with that, to that effect, counselors are also, we're slowly coming into what's called the counseling compact. We have, I think at the moment, we have 16 states that are a part of it. There are three that actually went through legislature that said, no, we're not going to be a part of it, which I found interesting. And I would love to talk to them to wonder, you know, what was the rationale for rejecting that? Um, mm -hmm. But even though you're part of the counseling compact, you still can't practice yet because it still has to go through the various state boards. How are they going to interpret that law? into how they practice. Now you can rest assured, nobody's going to give up a dollar bill. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? No one's going to give up the dollar nobody, bill. Nobody's going to give up the dollar bill. If you wanted to be licensed individually in every single state and jurisdiction, it's going to cost you over $14,000 just okay. to start, just to start. Uh, maintaining your licensure is going to run you roughly $10,000 a year. And that's just licensing fees. That's not CEUs or any of this other mm -hmm. business that you would have to do. You already know that it, when the counseling compact comes through, they're probably going to have some type of, oh, okay, so you can be licensed in North Carolina. And if you want to be part of the compact, then you're going to have to pay an extra fee so that you can sure. have this licensure in these other places. Um, who you want to know the tightest niche that I've ever worked with. She was a woman who worked with graduate school nurses on passing a specific exam in nursing for graduate school. There's mm -hmm. this, it's this tight exam and all these nurses would come to her with this test anxiety that if I don't pass this, I don't get this thing and I have to have this thing. So she's known all over the world as this woman who helps these graduate school nurses pass this exam. Does she need to advertise? No, she clearly has word of mouth and everything else, but she's also noticing, oh, well, Arizona now, somebody wants me in Arizona. Well, somebody wants me here, somebody wants me there. Well, I guess if somebody is charging $250 an hour for their services and is doing an excellent job and these people are getting the results, maybe they can justify $13,000 a year to be licensed or $13,000 to initially start up and $10,000 to maintain. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us can't. Most of us can't. But most of us still work in areas that are relatively small niches that certain parts of the country may have need for. Yeah. Yeah. And so how, how can someone uh, set themselves up for success to be able to get licensed in, Rob in a many bank. other states? Yeah. <laughs> Rob <Yeah>. a bank. <laughs> yeah. And so you were, and you were saying on the, on the national level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what, what are those things? Well, other than having a, copious amounts of money, uh, go ahead and take both national counseling exams. That's the NCE and the NCMHCE. When you take both of those, you will have met the examination requirement for all 50 states and, juris and four jurisdictions. Um, I don't include Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico has this interesting thing that, first off, their applications in Spanish. Secondly, in order to practice with clients in Puerto Rico, you have to be a resident of Puerto Rico, meaning you have to have an actual place where you live for 183 okay. days out of the year. So I didn't really include that in the, the four jurisdictions because of that requirement. Everybody else is moving yeah. all over the place and doesn't necessarily matter. Um, so you're going to take both exams. I also recommend taking the CRC, the certificate, the Certified Rehabilitation Counselor exam. Reason being is that's going to open up so many more doors for other avenues that you may want to go into, such as workers' comp or anything like that. Oh, okay. Um, I recommend, uh, and I've I've said this from the get go, and I heard this in graduate school too. Keep your syllabi. Oh, okay. Physically keep your syllabi. Also, if you can, on top of it, keep the catalog in the years in which you were enrolled there as well. Some states require it. Some states want actual copies from that time in addition to the syllabi from that time in order to verify your license if your degree was not from a KCRIP school. Uh -huh. um, there are some, some 
states are a little bit more lenient in that they're like, as long as it was accredited, we're good. We don't care if it was under the KCRIP accreditation or core, just as long as you have these and you're able to do what you need to do, go ahead. That's fine. A lot of them are changing over. You will be KCRIP and KCRIP only. And I think that's, that's going to come around to bite a lot of people in the butt because there are many of us who've been doing this for many decades who KCRIP before KCRIP got hold of the whole situation, most schools mm-hmm. didn't have KCRIP accreditation. Sure. And I mean, mine was core accredited, but, right. you know, they didn't have any of that, you know, roll into that type of situation. And there are some jobs that I can't apply for. Like at the VA, I can't apply for any of the jobs there because they require KCRIP accreditation, which oh, I think okay. is, is unfortunate because there are a lot of veterans out there who want, dare I say, an older therapist mm-hmm. and, if only new schools are putting it out, then you're going to get your relatively a younger therapist out there, but it's what it is. Um, I can work with you to somewhat k your degree, meaning, okay, so what are the requirements for k What are the courses that you took? How can we have this course meet that requirement? Because most states are actually okay with that. Not all. Again, for having some that thou shalt have cake up and nothing else, then you're going to be, you're going to be in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Um, so on your transcript, you're also going to have to make sure that you have 60 hours now. A lot of them way back in the day, you could get a 48 hour degree way, way back in the day in the eighties, you could get like a 36 hour degree and be good. But now it's a 60 hour degree. Check and make sure that you have your practicum and internship and your hours uh, on average, we're looking at about 2,500 hours for supervision. Some states are 3,000, 3,500, some are 2,000. Um, if you've been licensed for five years in, in just about every state, I think there's a couple that or might be seven years, you can waive a lot of that type of how much supervision did you have by virtue of the fact that you've been licensed for five years or better. Right. Um, but until that time, you better you better get tight on that. So having your transcripts together, making sure that they're sent, making sure that all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed if you haven't graduated from a CAKER program. Um, also, you're going to need to uh, make sure you fill out the application correctly and stay on it. I was working with somebody who was trying to be licensed in Tennessee, and we were working through there, and we put in the paperwork into the portal but then they changed the whole portal and they lost all of his paperwork, but they didn't bother to let us know. Oh, okay. So we're looking at, I was like, Matt, have you heard anything from these people? No, I haven't heard. Have you? No, I haven't heard anything. Call and find out what's going on. Well, of course, nobody answers. And, you know, you wait a while. And then finally, we just got upset. It was about nine, eight, ten months into it. Like, what happened? Oh, well, we never got this paperwork. I said, I uploaded it into the portal. Oh, well, we changed the portal. Well, you going to let anybody know? Right. So it was a year later, it was a year for him to get licensed in that state, just because people are changing the the portal. So keeping tight on your application, I'm a firm believer in if you can do paper and keep copies and send it certified mail, because then you get that nice little card afterward that says, oh, look, they got the thing. Mm -hmm. Always keep track of all that stuff. And you're going to have to be on top of it because they will not be. And really, at the end of the day, it probably is more the applicant's responsibility than anything else. Um, And then any other additional licensure that you may have, there are some states that say if you have a license in any healthcare profession or any profession that works with people, we need to see a copy of that registration or license. So like maybe you're an RN in, in some state or maybe you have a teaching certificate or some sort of something from somewhere. Some states actually require that too. So having your licensure, not only from other states that you may have in mental health counseling, but also in any other healthcare or any service providing occupation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that That's a great overview. So take, take both exams, uh, maybe even the CRC, uh, have all of your transcripts and your syllabi from the courses that you've taken um, and stay on top of it. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, what are some of the, you know, the things that you identified probably come from the things that people mostly struggle with in this process, uh, I would imagine. Is that right? Is, is there anything else that you'd like to mention that people 
often struggle with when, when applying for licensure in another state? Um, if they realize that they have to take another exam. Oh, yes. Then they're that's like, a, that's oh, a big shoot, one. what am I going to do? You know, I haven't been in, in graduate school in 20 years, and I don't know what the heck's on the exam or whatnot. Right. There, there is a website out there, two websites out there. Well, it's it's under one umbrella, but they come under two different things. There's uh, uh -huh. counseling, uh, is it nationalcounselingexam.com and counselorexamination.com. Um, they have test prep, and they oh, guarantee... Okay you know, you're going to pass the exam or you get your money back and you pay a significant chunk. But the mm -hmm. person that I worked with from Tennessee, he went through that and he says, I totally advocate for it. They did the best thing it was ever. And it was great. It was fantastic. So I would definitely advocate working with one of those test prep organizations. Now, here's a kicker. You've taken the exam and you want to apply to Oregon but it's been more than 10 years since you've taken the exam. You have to take it again. Oh, wow. Now you don't have to, you don't have to take them both, but you have to take one of them. And fortunately, yeah. Oregon is also open to the CRC as well. So I usually tell my people, okay, you've just taken this exam. You've passed, whether you're going to use it or not, it may not hurt you to go ahead and get licensed unless you love taking exams, go ahead and get licensed in Oregon while you still have a fresh exam under your belt. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a lot of clinicians, they don't live in the state to get their license. They don't have an office there. They don't ever plan on having an office there. They're just doing telehealth. Do any of the, do any of the states require that you have a business address in the state in which you're getting a license? To my knowledge, the most recent state, um, I'm trying to see if I understand your question correctly, that let's just say one lives in, oh, I don't know, Barcelona, if you're lucky enough to hang out there mm -hmm. <laughs> to international telehealth. Um, from what I'm gathering, most states do not require that you actually have a license in the state. There are some that say you have to have a license in the state from which you are practicing. To the yeah, state but, you are no, address, uh, an address. Oh, an actual brick and mortar. Yeah. Um, I yeah, have or not... just, a, just an address. Uh, so do you have to have a mailing, a business mailing address in the state in which you're getting a license? Uh, do any of the states require that? Florida has the telehealth license that you can get, but you have to have a registered agent in the state who has a an address in the state in order for you to be able to do okay. telehealth with a telehealth license in Florida. Now, if you have an actual real license in Florida, full license, you don't necessarily need that. South Carolina just also recently opened up the telehealth license. I'm researching that more and more now considering as I'm in a neighboring state, I don't know if I need to actually have a registered agent there either. Um, I'm not a hundred percent. That's, that really isn't my aim. I'm guessing that's more your aim in terms of that, because you know, the telehealth laws and whatnot. I'm just about getting actual licensure itself, not a telehealth. That, well, that, that's, that's what I mean. Getting licensed. It, it's all, my question's only about getting licensed. Uh, so to get licensed in any of the states in the United States, do any of them require that I have an address in that state? None that I have found. And I have okay. done the research. They do not mandate that you actually have your own personal address in the state in which you are obtaining licensure. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're saying that maybe South Carolina or yeah. And but, but those are the two that I know of that have specific telehealth licenses that don't have sure. like actual full licenses. I tend to lean more towards the notion of having a full license because what if you actually want to move there? Because Florida says, isn't it wonderful you have a telehealth license? You can't have a brick and mortar here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is okay. interesting. So yeah. But yeah. none of the states that I have researched indicate that you actually have to have a physical presence in that state to have the license with the exception, of course, of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another time this comes up a lot is if a clinician is going to work for a telehealth service provider, where that telehealth service provider is providing behavioral health services to people throughout the country. So yeah, they're, they're the ones that often will want to 
hire someone like you to get a bunch of people licensed in a bunch of different states, uh, which a lot of that's a lot of work. It's quite quite lengthy, I would assume. It is, it is, and especially depending on where they went to school and when they went. Um, again, if they've if the counselors have gone to a K group school and it was a sixty hour program, it's a heck of a lot easier than if they went to school a number of years ago in a program that wasn't K group accredited and they've been licensed for a long period of time, you know, there are some states that just say, we don't sure. care. It needs to be what it needs to be. Yeah. Now, is there a strategy in terms of getting licensed in particular states because they have reciprocity with a lot of other states? A weird conundrum with that. The Tennessee and Kentucky situation have actual reciprocity. If you have an LPC MHSP in Tennessee, that's the highest level of independent licensure in Tennessee, meaning you can actually throw a diagnosis on a person. Mm -hmm. If you have that license, Kentucky says, oh, good. Yeah, we'll just give you a license, send us some money, we'll call it good. Basically, send us money and a copy of your Tennessee and you're good to go. Now, Kentucky also has something with Ohio that's kind of similar, but I'm starting to wonder if Kentucky has something with Ohio, then it should be that Tennessee would have something with Ohio, but they don't yet. And I'm wondering why not. I think mm -hmm. maybe one would have to go the steps of Tennessee, Kentucky, and then Kentucky, Ohio before Tennessee could be with Ohio. Now, again, mm -hmm. the Counseling Compact is trying to trying to have that type of situation, but we have to get something that's called uniformity. What What is considered licensure material? What what is, what is our base that we need in order to have uniformity across the states that are going to be part of the compact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very much. So if someone wants help with this, they can reach out to you. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, through your website, which will be in the description, lpclicenseinfo.com. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ryan.